Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, I believe, our 13th session on the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. Uh, we left off at uh, verse number 59, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Qalu man fa'ala hadha bi alihatina innahu lamin al zalimin. They said, who has done this to our gods? Verily, he is among the wrongdoers. If you recall, we began uh, discussing the story of Ibrahim salam. And Ibrahim is mentioned throughout the Quran. And in this surah, it mentions his interaction with the idol worshippers in Kutha, which was the, uh, the place that he was living. And historians say that Ibrahim at this time was about 16 or 17 years old. He was a teenage boy. And virtually everyone in the community was an idol worshipper. His uncle, in fact, was the, was a manufacturer of idols. And he spent a lot of time debating and discussing and arguing for the existence of one God, negating and disproving polytheism. We mentioned in our previous session that there was a festival. It seems like it was a festival, an annual festival where the, uh, the Mushrikeen, they would leave the city, they would prepare the best of food, and they would present it to the idols. And Ibrahim salam stays behind. If you recall, in uh, he actually makes a vow. He says in ayah number 57, mudbirin. He makes a qasam. He tries to argue with them. He tries to use intellectual arguments to disprove the notion of multiple gods, to disprove idol worship. He, and he says, and by God, I shall scheme against your idols after you have turned your backs. Here he refers to the festival that uh, they were preparing to participate in. So when he's requested to join them, if you recall in Surah Safat, Surah 37, ayah number 89, he gives an excuse as to why he will not be joining them, why he's not going to go and attend this festival at the outskirts of the city. You know, he says that I am sick. Now, did Ibrahim السلام, lie? Notice the word that he uses. Physical ailment, physical sickness in the Arabic language is the word, the word that he uses is marav. He doesn't, he doesn't say inni marid. He says, I am saqim. And saqim is much more broad. It refers to just not feeling well. There could be nothing physically wrong with you, but he says, I don't feel well. And it could be a reference to, you know, just mentally he did not feel well. Emotionally he did not feel well because of the stubbornness of his community, because of how adamant they were about idol worship. So he stays behind. And in Ayah 59, as we mentioned last week, he, he destroys their idols. فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرْجِعُونَ So he broke them into pieces. He shattered the idols. So imagine the entire village, the entire city is celebrating. Out, they've emptied out of the city. They're celebrating in the outskirts. Ibrahim السلام, enters the temple. Presumably he has an axe with him or he has a hammer. 
and he shatters the idols into pieces. You know, he didn't just break them into larger pieces. He completely pulverized them. And some narrations say that he tied the axe around the head of the largest idol. So after this celebration, after the festival ends, the Mushrikeen, the people of the city, they return. They return to the temple to eat from the food that was blessed by the idols. Upon entering, they witness the fact that the, the, the temple was ransacked. They look at their idols. Their idols are broken into tiny, tiny pieces. So in a state of shock, they look at one another. As Allah says in ayah number 59, You can see, you can even sense the shock. They said, who has done this to our gods? Notice, they don't, they don't say who destroyed our gods or who pulverized our gods. Because number one, if they were to say that, it would, it would contradict their belief that these idols are gods. If they're gods, how can someone come and destroy them? How, how could they be so, such so defenseless? So they say, who did this? To our idols. Ayah number 60. Whoever did this is a, is a wrongdoer, is an oppressor, is a valim. Ayah number 60. Qalu. Now listen to how they belittle Ibrahim. Ayah number 60. Qalu sami'na fatan yadhkuruhum yuqalu lahu Ibrahim. They said, we heard a young man mention them. He is called Ibrahim. This ayah is interesting because, number one, they try to belittle Ibrahim in the following way. Number one, they say that they call him a youth. That he had, We heard a young person. So they seem to dismiss him. They seem to belittle him. Number one, on the count of his age. He's some foolish young person. Now, and this shows you that Ibrahim, even though he's only 16 or 17 years old, he's known for being someone who had great influence, that he was very active. We heard a young man mention them. Now again, they don't mention what he said about them because in their minds, what he says is sacrilegious. It's blasphemous. You know, so they're so devoted to their idols that they don't even want to relay what Ibrahim said about their idols because they consider it so blasphemous. We heard... A young person mentioned them. So this shows you that everyone in the city knew that Ibrahim had a reputation for religious debate. He was always debating. He was always mentioning them. So, سَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا فَتَنْ يَذْكُرُهُمْ يُقَالُ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ He is called... Ibrahim. Now, why would they say he is called? That they say his name is Ibrahim. Did they not know his name? They knew his name. But again, they, they do this to belittle him. You know when you want to disrespect someone and you know what their name is, but you say, well, what's, what's his name? What's, that, what's his name? What's that guy's name? They know his name. But they want to belittle him and treat him as someone so insignificant that they can't even recall his name. Who's that young guy that talks about our idols? What's his name? It's a type of tahqir. They wanted to belittle him and make him feel, 
make him sound like some irrelevant, insignificant person. So they knew his name. So number one, they mentioned that he's a youth, that he's just a young, foolish youth. And subhanAllah, you see, you know, history repeats itself. You know, this is one of the reasons why some of the companions of the Prophet, they dismissed Ali ibn Abi Talib. They say, oh, he's young. He's only 33 years old. How can he become the, the Khalifa? There are elders in the community. So you find that in many cases, it's, it's the elders who are misguided and, and it's the youth who speak truth, who are guided. And you see that in the Islamic tradition, youth are not seen as, as passive and unimportant in, in a society. If you look at the at Surah Al-Luqman, Surah, Surah 31, ayah number 17, when Luqman gives advice to his son, he says, Ya Bunay, and his son was young, he was a youth. Ya Bunay, aqim as salah Oh my son, establish prayer. Wa'amur bil ma'roof wanha anil munka. So not only do you have a responsibility to establish prayer, but you have a societal obligation to enjoin, to promote good, and to forbid evil. So youth are not just meant to sit on the sidelines. That here, the Quranic vision of a youth is that you are meant to play an important role, an integral role in the development and in the intellectual maturity of your society. So they say, قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا فَتَنْ يَذْكُرُهُ يُقَالُ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ Now, and this also points to the idea that Ibrahim alayhi salam was not reckless. You know, it's not that Ibrahim on day one, he came with a sledgehammer and just destroyed their idols. He had established a reputation of dialogue. He tried to convince them using syllogism, using, you know, uh, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning. So Ibrahim's first course of action with his community was words. He only resorted to destroying their idols when he felt that his words were falling on deaf ears. He had to move from argumentation to demonstration. So in this ayah, they discredit him because of his youth. They pretend to not even know his name, treat him as some insignificant person who's not even worthy of being known. They pretend not to know his name. And they, they mention what he did but without explicitly mentioning the things that he used to say about the idols. So it's almost as though they censor Ibrahim that, you know, he mentions the idols, but they don't specifically outline what he said about the idols because they deemed his statements about their gods to be blasphemous. So what do they do next? I number 61. قَالُوا فَأْتُوا بِهِ عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِ النَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْهَدُونَ They said, bring him before the eyes of the people so that they may bear witness. So it seems that there is an agreement that we should hold a trial, that we need to bring this man, we need to bring Ibrahim in front of the eyes of the people. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْهَدُونَ so that people can bear witness, so we can make an example out of him, right? So we can set a powerful message that if anyone criticizes our idols, if anyone undermines our idols, this will be the punishment. So, you know, so they wanted to make an example out of him. He committed a capital offense. So it's not enough to just capture him and throw him in a dungeon. Bring him in front of the people. فَأْتُوا بِهِ عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِ النَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ 
We want people to witness the punishment. We want people to witness the trial. Verse number 62. So they bring Ibrahim. It doesn't mention if he's he comes willingly or he's forced to, to come to this trial. In any case, he appears. This teenager, 16, 17-year-old monotheist who lives in a polytheistic society. So they bring Ibrahim and they, they start to question him. Verse number 62, أَأَنْتَ فَعَلْتَ هَذَا بِآلِهَتِنَا يَا Ibrahim. They said, was it you who did this to our idols? So again, notice, they don't, they don't ask Ibrahim, did you destroy our idols? Did you break our idols? Did you shatter our idols? What do they say? Because if, because if they say that, they're going to fall into a trap. Ibrahim alayhi salam, right away, he'll say that your idol, how can, if they're so powerful, how can they be, be destroyed? So, and it was almost so blasphemous that they just had to refer to his crime as, you know, was it you who did, did this? Was it you who did this to our gods, O oh Ibrahim? Now here Ibrahim alayhi salam, so again, everyone is listening. You know, this is a public trial. And he is presumably being questioned by the religious scholars, you know, the guardians of the temple. So these are the most likely the, the clergy, the, the, the polytheistic clergy. So they say, are you the one who did this to our gods, O Ibrahim? Ibrahim alayhi salam in ayah number 63. So imagine, it's a public trial. Everyone is watching. They're listening to, you know, the line of questioning. He's sitting, you know, in the, uh, in the chair or he's standing. Did you do this to our idols? What does he say? قَالَ بَلْ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ هَذَا he said, nay, but it was the largest of them that did this. So question them if they speak. Now again, there's a discussion among the scholars. So as I mentioned, when they question him about what they perceived as high crime they don't mention what he did to the idols because if if they did if they admitted that uh, that the idols were destroyed it would it would create an ideological problem for them ibrahim would have pounced on that that statement and said that you know i destroy your idols are are you listening to yourself I destroy your gods. What kind of gods can be destroyed and obliterated by a teenage boy? So he said, nay, but it was the largest of them that did this. So question them if they speak. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam, what does he do? He's trying to insinuate that there was an internal conflict between the idols. That I had, I had nothing to do with this. The largest god, the big idol, destroyed the smaller idols. Now, it seems that the reason why Ibrahim preserved the large idol and destroyed the smaller idols is because number one, the, the fact that there are large idols and small idols indicates that not all of the idols that they worshipped 
possess the same power. So there was a hierarchy among their gods. Now, it seems that Ibrahim السلام, preserves the larger idol and destroys the others because Ibrahim is trying to argue that the, the larger god, the more powerful god, destroyed the lesser gods because he was jealous of them. That, why, that he should be the one who was worshipped because he's larger. So Ibrahim is highlighting an important flaw in the concept of polytheism, this notion of multiple gods. And that is that if, if the universe was governed by multiple gods, conflict among them would be inevitable. As we mentioned earlier in the surah, Allah says, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَا If there were gods in them other than Allah, in the heavens and the earth, the universe, the heavens and the earth would be in disarray. There would be discrepancy. In another ayah, وَلَا عَلَى بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ Some gods would have overpowered others. Now, the question here, so that that's probably why Ibrahim preserved the larger idol. But here, not only does he preserve it, he blames. He says the, the larger idol, idol is the one that, uh, that destroyed the lesser gods. Now, question, did Ibrahim lie? Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam, is the one who destroyed the other idols. When they question him, he says it was the large idol. Was that a lie? Now, the reason, so this is a discussion among the, the Mufassirin of the Quran. Now, some Sunni commentators, they try to remedy this problem by saying that you know, perhaps Ibrahim wasn't baligh at the time. So some of them, they say it was a lie, but he wasn't mukallaf. You know, he was 15, 16 years old. He had not reached the age of religious accountability. Some Sunni scholars, they try to absolve him of sin by arguing that he's not mukallaf yet. However, We have a narration from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says, إِنَّمَا قَالَ بَلْ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ That when Ibrahim answered that it was the larger idol, everyone knew that Ibrahim alayhi salam did not mean that it was actually the larger idol that destroyed the, the smaller idols. So why did he say that? The Imam says, بَلْ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ إِرَادَةَ الْإِصْلَاحِ وَدِلَالَةَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَفْعَلُونَ Ibrahim said that the large idol did it to awaken and to use it as an argument to make them realize that idols don't have the power to do anything. So, the statement Bal Fa'alahu Kabirhum was was not meant to be an a, a factual response to the question, but rather it was a declaration to make the people think and realize that idols don't have the ability to do anything. They can't act, they can't perform any function. So that's one way of resolving it, that he, he, he provided contextual clues that he did not mean that as a factual statement. Rather, it was a statement to arouse that, uh, their fitrah, to arouse these important uh, questions. Other scholars say that Ibrahim's sentence, his statement was conditional, 
that the large idol did it, in kanu yantiqun, right? That bal fa'alahu kabiruhum hadha, that the lar that it was the largest of them that did this. So question them if they are if they are able to speak. Meaning, if they're able to speak, then the larger idol did this. If they're able to speak, then question them. So because it's a conditional statement, it's not, it's not a lie. Because Ibrahim is saying that the larger idol did it, and you can question them if, if they can speak. So because they cannot speak, then obviously it wasn't the largest, the larger idol that perpetrated the, the act nor can you even question them. Ayah number 64. فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ فَقَالُوا إِنَّكُمْ أَنْتُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ So they consulted among themselves. So Ibrahim gives them an explosive testimony. He shakes them up. He essentially makes a mockery of them in front of this massive crowd. You know, in this, you know, this would be the equivalent, this trial would be the equivalent of, you know, what we're seeing with the impeachment, you know, the public impeachment hearings. It's being broadcasted, everyone is watching. So, so imagine this public trial. He gives this explosive testimony, he makes a mockery of them. And he makes this compelling argument. He makes this compelling argument. And it gets them thinking. So they consult. They consulted among themselves. Who consulted? Presumably those who are heading, who are, who are, uh, who are holding the trial. The religious figures. So they consulted among themselves and said, Verily, it is you who are the wrongdoers. So they have a moment of clarity. Ibrahim السلام, succeeds in at, at least for a moment. At least for a moment, he awakens their conscience. And this shows you that even someone who is immersed in idol worship they still have, you know, that fitra. They still have a sense of what is true and what is false. And notice they say that verily it is you who are the wrongdoers. You know, so when they return from their festival and they see that their temple was ransacked, they say whoever did this to our gods is a wrongdoer. But here... After listening to Ibrahim, they say that you guys, you guys are you guys are in the wrong. What you guys are doing, it's silly, is nonsensical. So some Mufassireen say that Ibrahim السلام, was able to win the hearts of at least a few people. There were a few people who actually became monotheists as a result of this trial. Ayah number 65. So they have that moment of awakening, but then they go back. They go back to their twisted, nonsensical beliefs. So then they retorted, they reverted, they were reverted. You know, nukisu ala ru'usihim means that they were flipped upside down on their heads. Meaning that they had a moment of clarity, they perceived the truth, but because of social pressure, pressures, because of you know force of habit, whatever it was, they go back to their flawed line of thinking. Then they reverted. Certainly, you know they can't speak. They say, Ibrahim, you know that these idols, these gods, they don't speak. 
So they, they start, they try to make the argument that they don't need to speak. These idols are silent. They don't speak. They don't need to speak. They are above speech. You know, it could be that they were even arguing that that speech, the need for language, is an imperfection. That our gods, they can communicate without the medium of speech. You know, O oh Ibrahim, you know that they don't speak. They are silent. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he doesn't address the idea of them speaking or not in the next ayah, in ayah number 66. He said, do you worship apart from God? That which benefits you not in the least, nor harms? Okay, they don't speak. You say they don't speak? Fine. Why do you worship something apart from God which doesn't have the ability to benefit you in the least nor harm you in the least? I am, you know, Ibrahim, he's a teenager. He's a young boy who entered into the temple by himself. And he was able to single-handedly destroy them. They couldn't protect themselves. They can't protect themselves. How are they going to protect? So in ayah number 67, it seems that Ibrahim alayhi salam becomes fed up with them. So he for for months and months, maybe even years, he tries to have discussions with them. He brings forth arguments. He brings forth intellectual arguments. He, he demonstrates to them by destroying their idols that their idols are, they're weak, they're powerless, they can bring no harm, no benefit. But these people are adamant. They're trying to defend their idols. And then Ibrahim in Ayah 67, what does he say? Uffin lakum. وَلِمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ You guys still don't get it? Uffin. Fie upon you. Uff is, is, is an expression of frustration, of disappointment. That I have nothing else to say to you people. You guys are completely devoid of any logical thinking. Fie upon you and upon that which you worship apart from God? Do you not understand? Don't you have a mind? Don't you have intellect? How could you be so foolish? How could you be so ignorant? Now, you see the idol worshippers. So again, they then move on to announcing the penalty for the crime. They give their verdict. So the back and forth between the defendant and the prosecution comes to an end. They're not able to refute or address any of Ibrahim's challenges. And when people are not able to, when people in power are not able to address arguments, what do they do? They resort to violence. They try to destroy their opposition. Ayah number 68 is the verdict. This is the verdict that they give. They announce the punishment for the crime that Ibrahim committed. They said, they said, burn him and help your gods if you would take action. Meaning if you want to do anything, if you really want to make an example out of Ibrahim, if you want to take action, if you want to punish him, burn him. Uh, you see how, how cruel these people are. That they took what Ibrahim did to be so serious, 
such a serious crime, they don't say jail him or whip him. They say burn him, burn him alive. Why? They give a religious justification. You know, they were embarrassed. He humiliated them publicly. They want to kill Ibrahim because of their own, because they felt personally offended. But that's not what they say. They say, no, we are punishing Ibrahim for religious reasons. To try to make themselves sound noble. You know, in the same way, you know, some of the Khulafa after the, uh, the death of the Prophet, they wanted to prevent people from recording the ahadith of the Prophet. Because they had their own selfish interests. Because if they allow people to freely transmit the ahadith of the Prophet, there are too many ahadith in praise of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So what did they say? They banned the recording of, of hadith, and they give a religious justification. They say, oh, we're afraid that it might be confused with the Qur'an. Right. So sometimes, you know, when people want to commit crimes, they try to justify it with a religious argument. Similarly here, burn Ibrahim, burn him alive. Why? Is it because... You were embarrassed? Is, because, is it because he humiliated you? He made you look stupid in public? No, 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 no. Burn him and help your gods. They give a religious pretext to the punishment. Now, hariq, harriqu, means, you know, it's not just burning him. Burn him. And a, not just any fire, because the word the word nar means fire. Hariq is a type of fire with huge flames, meaning burn him in a fire that has flames that will engulf him. Now, after they give this, now it seems that Ibrahim wasn't burned immediately after the trial. They actually, you know, in Surah Safat, Surah 37, ayah number 97, they actually had to build a structure that could throw him into the fire because they, they built such a huge raging fire that even birds couldn't fly over it. They, they created, you know, a type of earthly inferno they wanted to incinerate him. In ayah number 97 of Surah Safat, قَالُوا بْنُ لَهُ بُنْيَانًا Build a structure فَأَلْقُوهُ فِي الْجَحِيمِ And then throw him into the fire. Meaning they, they built a catapult. So after the trial, after they announced the verdict, Ibrahim was in custody. He probably was in prison. They, they create this fire, they ignite this fire, and they spend at least a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, building a catapult. So Ibrahim السلام, is waiting to essentially be burned alive. They announce the day that they're going to enact the punishment. Now you can imagine that everyone gathers around, you know, just like with any any execution, you have people, people gather. You have people gather and they're watching. So they put Ibrahim alayhi salam in the catapult. Now I want you to to think for a moment and just try to picture Ibrahim. You know, at the end of the day he's a human being. He's put in this catapult, and he knows that in a few moments, he will be burning alive. Now, there's a hadith that mentions the moment in which he's catapulted into the fire. Now, you can imagine how, how massive this fire was that they don't even push him into it. 
Everyone is a, was afraid that they, they will be engulfed by its flames. They catapult him into the fire. They, fl they fling him into the fire. So the narration says that they put him into the catapult. Everyone is watching. They're going to they're gonna witness Ibrahim burn alive, burn to death. The narration says that when, they, when he's flung into the air, and you can imagine that those few seconds when he's in midair probably felt like an eternity. You know, you know, if you go on the, even on a roller coaster, you know, when you're going up and you're you're about to fall, that small drop feels like an eternity. Now, Ibrahim is completely suspended in the air. He has nothing to protect him. His hands are tied. So the narration says that Jibra'il appears. He's in midair. He's about to fall into this inferno. Jibra'il says, Ya Ibrahim, alaka haja? Do you need do you need anything? Do you need any help? Now if it was you and I, we would say, Oh Jibra'il, I need a lot of help right now, right? Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, Amma ilayka fala. I do need help, but not from you. Wa amma min Allah fabala. But do I need Allah's help? Yes. Now, there's a question here. Why doesn't Ibrahim ask Jibra'il for help? Right? Because some people might use this hadith and say, look, Ibrahim doesn't use any tawassul. He go. He wants to. He wants God to help him directly. Jibrail offers to be his wasila. However, this is an incorrect understanding of the hadith. Why? Because you only do tawassul with a being that is superior to you. Ibrahim is superior to Jibrail. So Ibrahim السلام, it wouldn't make sense for him to use an intermediary that is inferior to him. He is the closest person to God, even among the angels. Here, Ibrahim السلام, this hadith is demonstrating to us his fearlessness, that he, he doesn't have a single worry in the world. He knows that he's in need and... And therefore he says, so Jibra'il says to Ibrahim, why don't you ask Allah? If you need Allah's help, ask him. Ibrahim says, Ilmuhu bihali yughni an su'ali. That God's knowledge of my condition makes it unnecessary for me to even call upon him. Now this doesn't mean that a person shouldn't ever make dua, but in this instance, Ibrahim السلام, demonstrates that he is completely at peace, that he has full trust in God. It's not that Ibrahim is trying to say, you know, I don't ever need to make dua because Allah knows my condition. Because we see in Ibrahim's life that he's always making dua. He asks Allah for, for children. He asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the building of the Kaaba. But in this particular instant, Instance, he wants to demonstrate his full tawakkul, that God, God's knowledge of my situation makes me free of even making, even needing to call upon him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next ayah, Allah intervenes. قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ We said, Allah is speaking using the majestic we, O fire be coolness and peace for Ibrahim. قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ O fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the fire. He commands it to change its nature. Fire is hot, it has heat, it burns. 
be cold. Kuni barden. Bard means cold, coldness, coolness. Wasalaman ala Ibrahim. Some of the Mufassirin, they say, لو لم يقل الله سلاما لمات إبراهيم من شدة بردها Allah says be, be cold and peaceful for Ibrahim the commentators of the Quran they say if Allah only said be cold Ibrahim would have froze to death in the fire so Allah says, be cold and be, be a place of peace for Ibrahim. Now you may say, why didn't Allah just say, Kuni salaman ala Ibrahim? Be peaceful with Ibrahim, for Ibrahim. It seems that Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to demonstrate his power, that he is able to make fire, he can change the nature of fire and make it. So fire is extremely hot. It's extremely hot. Allah has the ability to completely change its nature and make it extremely cold. And then, وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَانِ And then Allah makes it secure, a place of security and peace for Ibrahim. And then in ayah number 70, and we'll conclude here. وَأَرَادُوا بِهِ كَيْدًا فَجَعَلْنَاهُمُ الْأَخْسَرِينَ They desired to scheme against him, but we made them the greatest losers. Why does Allah say we made them the greatest losers? Because they failed to defeat him in debate, and they failed to kill him because of this miracle. So they failed on both counts. They failed to defeat him when he debated them. They, fe they, failed, they failed even in the trial. And they failed to kill him because of this miracle. Now, I want you to understand these surahs and hear them from the perspective of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Allah is consoling the Prophet. That the Prophet, again, he's going through difficult times in Mecca. Allah is sharing this story with Ibrahim, saying that, Ya Rasulullah, Ibrahim also suffered. They, they, discredit, they tried to discredit Ibrahim. They tried to kill Ibrahim. And, and this could even be a foreshadowing that, Oh Muhammad, they will try to assassinate you they will try to kill you in the same way they tried to kill Ibrahim. And we will rescue you from their plots just as we rescued Ibrahim. We made them the biggest losers. And subhanAllah, this young boy in Babylonia, thousands of years ago, he was the only monotheist. They tried to destroy him today. Allah made him victorious. Why? Because Jews, Christians, and Muslims, they all call themselves adherents to the Abrahamic tradition. They try to erase his memory. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his name and his legacy live on. Because he remained steadfast. He was devoted he was devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, purely devoted to Allah. He committed himself to Allah and Allah made his remembrance eternal. So he made those who plotted against him, they are swept into the dustpan of history. But Ibrahim alayhi salam, because of these type of stands, Allah immortalizes him. And he makes him the patriarch of prophets. From his progeny, all of the prophets of Bani Israel emerge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin.
thank you very much, Sheikh. So this is a, what, what, so what, what's the, the next part of the story? Or what, what happens when people see that Prophet Ibrahim is in the fire and, and nothing's happening to him? So, so Namrud is in power at the time. And it is believed, I believe, I, I, would, ha I would have to look at the, uh, the biography of Ibrahim and Qasas al-Anbiya. But it seems that, that he ends up moving. That again, some, I would imagine that some people join him. That I'm sure a miracle like that would soften the hearts of others. That some people might have joined him and became monotheists. But after some time, uh, it seems that Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, moves, moves on to another, uh, moves to another uh, region. But Ibrahim alayhi salam did have, did have some followers. So I mean, you see, if you look at the, the discussion and the trial, there were definitely some people who, who had, uh, who had a, sort, a type of awakening. And it's, uh, it's not far-fetched to conclude that some people uh, converted and perhaps even more converted after they witnessed uh, that miracle. But again, the majority, the majority of them remained mushrikeen and Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim seemed to have uh, moved, uh, moved out of the region. So I guess we don't really have much of a narrations about what happened directly after the, the same day or something. I'm not sure. I, I would have to check. I, I, I didn't really, uh, look at that part of the, uh, the account, but I, I would have to check. I think a good, a good resource is uh, God's Emissaries by Sheikh Rabwan Arastu. I, I'm, I'm sure he speaks about what happened uh, in the aftermath, what happened immediately after they tried to, uh, they tried to kill him. I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me if some just thought that he was a sorcerer. You know, it's the same thing. You know, whenever prophets perform miracles, you have a certain group of people who are going to chalk it up to sorcery, that he's a sorcerer. I mean, that's, that's definitely what happened in the story of Musa and Fir'aun. He performed all of these miracles and they accuse him of being a sahab. How, how is the situation of Prophet Abraham not asking for uh, Jibreel's help because your prophets only search for intercession with beings superior to them? How is that situation different from a person asking someone else for help? even though they know that the help really comes from Allah, like a prophet asking the people around him for help to fulfill a certain task. Yeah. Now, how is that different from asking help from, uh, from anyone around you? Now, again, it, in this specific instance, Ibrahim alayhi salam did not, he, he declines the, the help of Jibra'il. Now again, Jibra'il is, is an angel and so from a fiqhi perspective, let, let me explain it to you like this. You have a responsibility to save your own life if your life is in danger. So if I'm drowning in a swimming pool and there's a 10-year-old who is nearby, I can't say that, you know, because, you know, and let's say that this person is, I can't say that I'm not going to ask you for help. I'm just, I'm just going to rely on Allah and I'll only seek the help of someone who's superior to me. Of course, that would be nonsensical. If Ibrahim alayhi salam was able to acquire some assistance from someone in Alam al dunya it seems that it would have been an obligation for him to save his life. But because Jibra'il, again, is not, is not a human being, he's not, he's not in, that, uh, in that realm, there, was, there is no obligation upon... Ibrahim السلام, to accept the help of an angel. Now, when it, because it seems that he understood that 
you know, this is an angel offering me help. I have a closer relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah knows my uh, my situation. So it's a good question, but I, I don't think it applies to the instance with, with Ibrahim because at that at that moment, Ibrahim may have thought that Perhaps his martyrdom, uh, maybe in his mind, was probably most pleasing to Allah. Maybe he believed that his martyrdom would have more of an impact than being rescued by Jibra'il. So we could, because what Ibrahim cares about is Tawheed, the propagation of monotheism. So it could be, again, this is we're just speculating. We don't know why... Uh, he declined uh, the help of Jibra'il, but just as a general principle that with shafa'a, with tawassul, you intercede or you, you, seek the, you seek an intermediary who's at a higher spiritual rank, right? So it could have been that Ibrahim alayhi salam, at least in that moment, may have believed that my martyrdom could have more of an impact than me being rescued by Jibra'il. And therefore he just leaves it to God. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes. So, so that, that's why, that could be why he doesn't even ask, oh Allah, save me. He says, oh Allah, I, whatever is best. If it's best for me to be saved, then rescue me. If it's better for me to die and be a martyr, then I accept that as well. Allah alam. That that's you know that's what I would understand from the, uh, the narration. A slightly tangential note is how 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 would this qualify as the definition of intercession? Because I guess there's different ways we interpret intercession, and the one that was kind of being referred to here, where people might use this as an argument that hey, you're not supposed to be asking for intercession between anyone between you and Allah, what type of definition are they referring to here? And how would that apply to this, this story in the first place? So intercession, shafa'a, or tawassul. Because it's like being used as a proxy for saying, asking someone for help. Wait, say that last part again? Because this, it, it seems like intercession in this case is being is used to mean asking someone for help, mm -hmm. uh, in which case it would be weird to use this as, an, as a reason to say that, hey, you shouldn't ask anyone but Allah for help when whoever makes the argument would clearly be asking other people for help during the course of their lives. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's an excellent point. But I mean, again, going back to the original argument that I made about, uh, about tawassul in general, you know, tawassul, you know, if, if you have if you have a desire, a request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask oh Allah for the sake of this person, for the sake of that person, or you ask someone who's superior to you to make a dua for you, you're only gonna ask someone to you know to intercede for you or to uh, to be an intermediary, to be a wasila between you and Allah if they have a closer relationship with Allah. Now again. On earth, at this time, no one is higher than Ibrahim. So he, is, if anything, Jibra'il needs Ibrahim as a wasila. So this cannot be used as evidence for, okay, we should only call upon God and not call upon anyone else. Ibrahim السلام, is the closest He's the closest person to Allah among people, among jinn, among angels. So him declining Jibra'il's request, his, his help, doesn't mean that that there's that tawassul is uh, is unfounded. What it means is that he is the primary wasila between creation and God. It doesn't make sense for him to have someone inferior to him intercede. It doesn't make sense for, for, uh, 
for uh, uh, Ibrahim السلام, to ask Jibra'il. It doesn't make sense because this is a moment where Ibrahim is, is uh, demonstrating his complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and, and it sounds like a, that the type of intercession being referred to where you only expect someone superior to you to intercede with God on your behalf is when you're expecting that superior person to be making a dua on your behalf instead of that person taking a direct action. Yeah. So if that were to apply here, that would imply that Jibreel was, would have just been planning to do dua on, to make dua on uh, Hazrat Ibrahim's behalf instead of taking a direct action. From the narration, it's, it seems that Jibreel offered, because Jibreel asked, Alaka haja? Do you have, do you need anything? Ibrahim says, no, I don't need anything from you. Now, Jibra'il surely had the power and the ability to intervene, to, to protect uh, Ibrahim. But again, the point that, that is being made here is that Ibrahim السلام, wants to just demonstrate his, his complete trust in Allah. Select a certain prophet saved by God protecting uh, Tawheed and not other prophets, such as Prophet Yahya or even Prophet Isa? So, as I mentioned, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting the message doesn't necessarily mean that the individual has to be preserved. Now, in the case of Isa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam was preserved. He was kept alive, and he'll have a role to play in Akhir Zaman. But other prophets who were killed, that doesn't mean that, that their mission failed. You know, sometimes it's, it's through martyrdom that individuals are immortalized. You know, just like Imam Hussein alayhi salam. You know, it was actually through his death that he kept the, the, the message alive. So sometimes preserving the message necessitates that certain tragedies need to take place because those tragedies become part of the collective memory of the people and they're eulogized and they're memorialized because of it. But again, in Allah's wisdom, Ibrahim السلام, needed to be preserved. Because he had, he had other things that needed to be done. Allah wanted him to achieve other, uh, certain things. And Allah wanted him to have children. He wanted him. There were other tasks that Ibrahim السلام, was destined to, uh, to complete. If Ibrahim died in that fire, it, no, none of there would be no prophets. After, I mean, if you think about it, there would be no. Ismail, there would be no Ishaq, there would be no, there would be no Prophet, there would be no Ahlul Bayt. So, the, so Ibrahim, Ibrahim has to be preserved. Now you may say, okay, Ibrahim dies and Allah sends another Prophet. There is something about Ibrahim. Ibrahim has to be saved. Because Ibrahim, there is something about Ibrahim that is unique. He's, he's irreplaceable. There were certain things that he was destined to achieve. Allah wanted him to have progeny. And uh, someone like Ibrahim is, uh, is irreplaceable. He's indispensable. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves him because there was, there was still more for him to, uh, to accomplish. That's interesting. This really this ties into what you were saying earlier about how Prophet Ibrahim didn't uh, ask Allah for help. Prophet Ibrahim was just saying, hey, look, whatever happens will happen. I trust in Allah's uh, wisdom and will to do whatever is right. Yeah, and this, this is why Ibrahim, alayhi salam, you know, even among the, the five prophets, the five messengers of great resolve, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, it seems that Ibrahim is the second greatest among the messengers. 
there's something very unique about Ibrahim. Ibrahim, السلام, I mean, if you look at Yusuf, السلام, when he was in prison, what does he say to the, to the guard? You know, re uh, remember me with your, uh, with your, uh, your Lord, your master. So other prophets, again, it's not a sin, but Ibrahim السلام, was the most monotheistic of, of the, he was more than others. His trust in Allah was much deeper than uh, other prophets. You know, the ranking of prophets is not arbitrary. The, the tawheed, the, uh, the spirituality of, of Ibrahim is greater than Yahya, it's greater than Lut, greater than Harun. So if you look at Ibrahim السلام, he was so humble before God that you know, it, it, look at the way Allah describes Ibrahim. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan lillah. Ibrahim was qanit. You know, qanit comes from, from the word qunut. Qanit means to worship God with complete devotion and humility. Whereby, you know, when, when you and I worship God, when we worship Allah, it's very transactional. We see we see ourselves and we see Allah. It's, it's me and it's you. But with Ibrahim, there is no me. It's only Allah. That he sees himself as so insignificant that anything that he does, he doesn't even see it as a sacrifice. Because he, to him, the only thing that really exists is God. Everything else is so insignificant that it, it is, it's almost as though it doesn't exist, including himself. So that level of devotion is, is found in Ibrahim. You know, that's why Allah wanted Ibrahim to build the Kaaba. Ibrahim was wealthy. Ibrahim could have hired a bunch of construction workers. Come and build it. Allah wants the hands of Ibrahim to build it because there's barakah. If Ibrahim does it, it's special. Because everything Ibrahim does is purely for God. And that's why everything that Ibrahim touches, it lasts. Hajj is all about Ibrahim. It's just going through the footsteps of Ibrahim. Allah, Allah, all the prophets come from Ibrahim's progeny. Why? Because there's something very pure about this man. He is the father of prophets. So he's yeah he's he's very unique his his spiritual status is in a league of its own of course the prophet and the ahlul bayt they're above him but uh, after ahlul bayt ibrahim i would say is next and what was the sharia that prophet ibrahim was following since the first sharia started with prophet musa so the first uh, the first sharia was actually not uh, Musa it was uh, it was Nuh So Nuh had uh, the first comprehensive sharia Adam السلام, had some ethical precepts you know because when, when you have such a small society you don't need an elaborate code of law you don't need an elaborate code of conduct you know, it, uh, you see a more comprehensive uh, religious law with, uh, with Nuh. Now, Ibrahim, he had his, his, uh, his own, uh, own sharia. So you have Nuh, you have Ibrahim, Musa had his own sharia. Isa, السلام, was following the sharia of Musa. And then Rasulullah brings his own sharia. All right, uh, thank you. And, and in verse 64, um, could you kind of clarify a little bit about who is talking to who when they say, surely you are you yourselves are the unjust? In ayah number 34? Uh, 64, sorry. 64, okay. 
فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ فَقَالُوا إِنَّكُمْ أَنْتُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ So they consulted among themselves. So again, the Qur'an doesn't specify who these individuals are, but they're probably the polytheists and they're probably the, the, uh, the religious clerics, those who are holding the, uh, the trial. And uh, it seems that they start pointing the finger at each other. And then they're saying, you guys are uh, the, uh, the wrongdoers. Because the ones who are going to consult one another are, you know, the ones who are prosecuting Ibrahim. So they consult, and it seems that this group of mushrikeen, they have that, that moment of clarity. They say, you know what, he, he actually makes sense. You know, you guys don't make sense. You guys are the wrongdoers. You know, you guys tell people that these gods are worthy of worship, but he's completely debunked your uh, your ideology. So when they say, verily, it is you who are the wrongdoers, it seems that they're pointing the finger at each other. And then, quickly, I mean, in the next verse, they come back together. They flip, and they they uh, they unite, and they they continue to. Uh, to, uh, to question and interrogate uh, Ibrahim. Yeah, it's, just, it's interesting that they say that you, you are the wrongdoers instead of saying, yes, we were wrong. Because the, whoever's saying this is pointing the finger outwards and not admitting to their own wrongdoing. Yeah, you are, you are the wrong. And again, we, we don't know. We don't know details about... about uh, these uh, these individuals you know maybe some were elders so you might have senior religious clerics and junior religious clerics you know there might be senior guardians of the temple and you know uh you know uh, uh, new guardians of the temple so there might have been some type of uh bureaucracy some type of hierarchy where you know those who are who were uh who were in had lower positions maybe they were blaming those who are more senior to them, we don't know. Oh, thank you very much, Sheikh. This is really interesting as always. Alhamdulillah. I hope you guys benefited and inshallah we will uh, continue our discussion next week. We're going to be covering a lot of prophets, so it's going to be nice to kind of get glimpses into the lives of, uh, of different prophets. Inshallah we all uh, can benefit from that. Yeah, inshallah. I'm looking forward to it. Keep me in your dawn, inshallah. We'll see you guys soon. See you.